we want to keep it at at the right size whatever that size is at any moment we want to we want to know who our people are what their wife's names are and you know what their kids names are um i'm not interested i think joe thinks the same way but i let him chime in on that uh, we we don't have we don't have this goal of of being a giant guitar manufacturer Today, I'm hanging out with Joe Nags and Peter Wolf from Nags Guitars. And uh, we're going to talk today about Nags Guitars. Every average, no offense to Joe, every average <laughs> Joe guitar player thinks they know the story of Nags. Guy works at Paul Reed Smith Private Stock, starts his own company. So if you guys could tell me what they don't know, what's the real story behind that? You know, I was running Private Stock. I was also running research and development at PRS, and both of us were kind of top executives there. Um, but there was a time when uh, Paul had this thing that he wanted to put a non-compete in, okay? And, and it actually wasn't, for, it really wasn't linked to the guitar side of things as much as his, uh, he was working on this patent for this sound engineering thing with his dad. So he wanted to put that in and it kind of sparked me to start building some guitars on the side that I would like a lot better than a PRS because I really wasn't a PRS guitar player. You know, I was a, I was a pretty heavy duty guitar player as a kid. I used to practice six, eight hours a day. And, you know, we played in a jazz band and even played with Eva Cassidy at some point. And, you know, so, so I love guitar playing and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to make a guitar that I kind of would rather uh, play myself than the actual PRS. And it was kind of like a reason to do that. So I would go over to my buddy, Eric Johnson's house. He's not the Eric Johnson guitar player that everyone knows, but, and he's a really, really dear friend of mine, like a brother. And I would go over there on the weekends and um, I would start working on, uh, a couple guitars uh, because I kind of felt like I might need something to fall back on if this non-compete thing really went forward. You know, I didn't like the idea that I was building guitars for 20 years or whatever it was, 15 or whatever it was at that time. And then all of a sudden I wouldn't be able to build guitars if they were my own. Right. And so I kind of started this, um, these guitars. So I really, uh, where it really began was I was looking at a Telecaster at my buddy Eric's house and I looked at the bridge and the bridge wasn't screwed down in the front and it was kind of sticking up in the front. And I thought to myself, well, why don't they just screw the front of the bridge down? Okay. Uh, bridge plate, I should say, you know, not the saddles, but the bridge plate itself. <clears throat> and I felt like there would probably be a lot of uh, sound loss there. Me and my buddy Eric made a bridge that was a sort of like a Telecaster bridge, and uh, but it had a regular single coil pickup in it, not the Telecaster pickup. Made a prototype of it, and at the same time, I was kind of designing the chop tank, and I was designing the Severn at the same time. These were ways of falling back on something if I needed to. And uh, we made this bridge, and I put it on the chop tank I was built. I just built the chop tank by hand. This was all by hand. And um, I never heard a guitar ring so good in my life. So it was like, it really did kind of spark my interest towards making my own guitars. Uh, and I also at the same time was building a couple acoustic guitars there, actually one, it was the Patuxent uh, because I had a Cowling C10 and I, it was, it was sort of a small, it's a small guitar. It was a killer guitar, but it was kind of small. And I wanted to combine that guitar with a dreadnought shape because the dreadnought was kind of too big to sit on a couch and play. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very cumbersome, you know? So I had these guitars, I had this bridge design and I really liked them a lot. And so we tried to start bringing that into PRS. And we did at first, we were building the Severns there and the chop tank. And even the Patuxent and the Potomac, I built in private stock. That didn't really pan out. So that really sparked me to kind of want to keep going 
with starting my own business because now I had these guitars that I really liked a lot and I loved playing them and they sounded really great. And so I didn't want that to go by the wayside neither. And that's what really sparked my interest to start my own business and uh, left PRS. And that's really how it happened. And then at the same time too, this chop tank bridge that I had done, I liked the way it screwed down in the front because it, it didn't matter what, how soft the wood was, it was stable. So we actually chopped that bridge in half and I put a pin through the back for a tremolo version of it. And that didn't work too good. Uh, it kind of got stuck and it would go out of tune. So we developed another uh, system with ball bearings and a dog pin screw that would allow that back part to float and the front part to be stable like the chop tank was. And so that really worked out well also because now the, now the bridge isn't riding on a knife edge, okay? <clears throat> which the knife edge rocks back and forth eventually. Well, this is stably screwed down into the, into the guitar and all that rocks off of that plate, okay? So that's where the, the tremolo came from. Anyway, these are things that is developing sort of on the side while I was working at PRS. And we tried to bring them into PRS, but Paul really didn't want to have anything to do, which I understand, you know, it, it's, it's kind of combining two businesses into one and, and he didn't really want to do that. And Peter was trying to bring those guitars into PRS also. He liked the way they were and he was trying to really bring that into this, while he was there, was trying to bring those into the system also. I felt that um, there was a whole segment of the marketplace that PRS didn't really cover. They didn't have six in the side headstocks. They didn't have flat tops. You know, they didn't have bold ons in the beginning. Um, and I felt that there were opportunities out there if we would bring in additional designs, um, especially the ones Joe came up with since he pretty much designed everything that came out of that place after 93. There's a lot of guitars that that you know that PRS came out out with that Joe actually designed and you know when I started to work directly for them as international sales manager in 1997, um, there were a lot of things I learned that I didn't know before when I was a dealer or a distributor in Europe, and one of them was uh, who was who was sort of the creative uh, mind and the the guy who was actually building all the all the new models coming up with the new models um you know and that was kind of like for me sort of a revelation and then joe and i became friends and you know we hung out all the every time i was in the u.s before i moved here and so there were a lot of things that i felt would contribute to greater success if we would bring in additional designs but as joe said paul didn't want that pretty much everybody actually there who was in senior executive um uh, want liked the idea but uh, paul didn't want to do that and then there were a few other things that sort of like went <clears throat> went not so great uh, and that you know, kind of like led to my to my leaving and then you heard what joe said we didn't speak much. Uh, I think when he finally called me on June 28, 2009 and said, uh, tomorrow's my last day. I said, sounds good. Let's get together whenever you, whenever you can. And then we went together in North Carolina for a week with our families. And that's when we really hashed out what we're going to do. So I want to add something. <clears throat> when I designed for PRS, you know, I always designed, um, uh, for PRS, I always had PRS in mind, okay? And um, when I designed these other guitars, I had my desires in mind, okay? Uh, I played a 61 Strat for a long time and it was a great guitar, but there was things about it that I thought could be improved on. So, and I also played a Gibson ES-125 quite a bit. Uh, so, you know, I like, I like the Gibson camp. I like the Fender camp. So I really wanted to take that and design from that side and start improving or, or whatever you want to call it, changing some things that I thought would be good to change out of those camps. Um, you know, 
a lot of people thought, you know, well, Joe designed a PRS, so the guitars he designed are must be like PRSs. I actually don't think that's the case at all. No, I, I think they're way more toward the Gibson and a Fender than they are toward the PRS, you know? So of course there was some stuff in there from a design element, but, but that's the way I see it. I was combining a lot of this stuff together, you know? So a lot of people aren't going to realize this, but I realized that your partnership, your team that you guys have, you two, you need someone who really understands guitars on a very powerful level. And you need somebody who understands the market and the sales and distribution. I don't think a lot of people realize your how, integral your partnership was i mean really besides your friendship i mean let's be honest that that partnership your guys your skills together are a powerful you know powerful thing thank you yeah, yeah I, thank you i feel the same way actually and and we also have other people on the team that are really really good too yeah. you know so that's a big deal too like danny came over with me from prs and him and i built all the all the prototypes of prs and so we had this ability oh, to, yeah, we had this ability to start a guitar from nothing, you know, drawing on a piece of paper. And I would work with Danny and we would make the first guitar. I would carve it and then boom, we had a guitar. So that was an important part of this process because to have that ability to start a guitar from nothing, because that's what I did there. A lot of people know me as private stock but a big part of what i did there was actually run the r d department okay and we used to have product development meetings where we would bring products in and discuss them and then okay let's go to market with this but that all started with building a prototype first okay and so i would draw a guitar and danny and i would work on making that first outline of the guitar and get it up to the spot where it was a prototype we could bring to the meeting and talk about, okay? Once that prototype was done, then it was our job to take that guitar and do all the thousands of things you need to do to put it into production, okay? So that ability there was a big part of starting this business because we were making guitars from scratch, okay? And to come out with that many models that quickly that had to be done with another partner like Danny who could program a CNC machine on the fly, okay? So these things all were integral to making this be able to go from the beginning. There's some things that you guys do that was industry changing, okay? And these are my observations and we can confirm what I'm off on or what I'm right on. So a couple things that you did that were industry changing. First of all, um, your tops. Think about this. You know how many companies I interview that go, we came up with a new color stain. I'm like, that's really great. Have you seen this crazy stuff that Nags does where it's like, this is one color going one way and this color goes another way? Do you know how many factories and shops that I've been to that have told me how hard it is to get stain to not bleed over on the side. And here you guys are doing it right on the, like literally right on the top of the guitar. There's two stains. No one had seen that before. No one. Where did the idea from that come from? Where did you go? Hey, you know what? I'm going to do the hardest thing. And then I'm going to stick it on the top of the guitar. We were making guitars that, um, and it's actually something I did at PRS on the Severns that we did there. Cause we built a few Severns there where I did a laminate on the top and then carved it. Okay, so basically you had alder back, a curly maple middle, and then you laminated a piece of sapele on the top, and then you carved it so it left the sapele there, but it carved into the maple. Okay, so that's kind of where the idea came from. All right, but uh, I can tell you with the other, with what you're talking about. Um, so actually with those, I could stain that sapele a different color, but you still had the situation where it could bleed. So anyway, I was, I was actually laying in bed, uh, actually with cancer. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, you walk into a music store and you see thousands of guitars, okay? How do you make a guitar that will stand out? From the other ones but won't look silly because of the shape okay it's not like 
it wasn't like a shape thing, okay, where people make crazy shapes and, oh, wow, look at that one stands out because it's this crazy shape. I don't want to play that. But anyway, with this, I thought to myself, well, I want to be able to stain the guitar two different colors, okay? We have this beautiful piece of curly maple, and I want to be able to do it two different colors. How do we pull that off? So we made the first one. We actually made the first one with two channels. It's the double purfling thing. So we could actually stain the one side and then stain the strip in the middle a different color and then stain the middle. Whether or not I want to tell the world how we're doing that. I'm oh, not, no, I'm really not asking sure. that. I'm just, you know? I just want to talk about uh, the idea. Where the idea came from. That's where the idea came from. So with that being said, you can do stains. So, I mean, we did the first guitar and it was like, and I think the first one we did maybe was on a creation series. Okay. It was the, um, it was the, it was I it the, the black say the, the ship one. No, I think it was the, it was no. the Arizona one monument yeah. valley I mean, you may you may be right it may have been the uh the black pearl yeah it was so anyway we did it on a creation series guitar and it sparked this idea of like okay now where do we go with this i mean do we put purple with yellow do we put you know red with green you know what do we do here do we do subtle ones and so we kind of just started doing all sorts of different color combinations and that's where it came from now eventually we did one that had um, a stained outside, but an opaque middle. Yeah. So that combined stain with opaque, okay? And then like the one you have in the back there, okay, let's do two different opaque colors. Green, okay, seafoam cream green. and seafoam green. And, and in fact, Washington Music ordered some that were based off of the uh, Chevy colors, you know, the Chevy Bel Air colors. It pops because, not because it's a cool color combination, because that's enough to get your attention too. It pops because you've never seen it before. Right, what you said early on, or what Joe said early on, looking at everything you got at the back of your wall, the kind of sticks out, <laughs> like Absolutely. a sore thumb. Yeah. Absolutely. It's actually, the two guitars that stick out to me are the Parker Fly, Fly and, and that yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, the Parker sticks out because of the shape. Yep. Yep. You know, and then of course the other ones are classic shapes. So they all sure. look good. You know what I mean? But anyway. Yep. You're right. The other industry changing thing was, and I tried, like I, I tried to remember, but I couldn't figure, I couldn't remember. First time I ever heard an eight and a half radius was you guys. I was like, what's eight and a half? Like, I was like, <laughs> you know how you look at your spec sheet and you're like, What's eight and a half? Wait, why is it eight and a half? So where did eight and a half, where did that come from? So I played I played a Strat seven and a quarter inch radius. Okay. Right. Very, you know, very tight radius. And I wanted to keep that same classic feel, but I didn't want it to fret out when you bent the strings. So to me, eight and a half was like right at that spot where you could, you could bend the strings and it not fret out. So that was the idea behind that. I wanted that classic feel, you know, yeah. but so that, that's where eight and a half inch radius came from. And, and the reason why this stuff's important now, like I said, that's what's great. We can hindsight it now, right? If we had this, if we, if we did a podcast when you guys started, it would be terrifying because everything you guys did, like, like my Parker behind there, I like to pick on the Parker. The Parkers are gone. They went out of business because the reality is, Guitar players, not that great when it comes to innovation, new ideas, new exciting things, trying new things. They're really not, right? If you want to sell a guitar player something, find something that somebody did a long time ago and just regurgitate that. Right. To, to give guitar players new, especially expensive new, right? Now, now you gotta get you gotta get their mind open and their wallet open. Two things that are very hard to do with guitar players, right? When they see things like, wow, that's because some of your you know crazy tops, you're like, okay, that's a crazy top. And now what's this random radius thing, you know, and this bridge that I cannot understand, you know, um, I had luckily for me and your bridge is this, I didn't even have to try your bridge to know how good it was. Um, I saw the video. In fact, I'll probably clip it in at some point in this one when I'm talking, when we do the final, it's Larry Mitchell and, and Steve, I cutting heads. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Vi's, you know, you know, Vi's not easy on the tremolo arm, right? He's just killing it. He's just beating that thing to death. And there's Larry holding his own, right? No Floyd. <laughs> Your bridge is just holding tune perfectly, right? Um, you know, which is pretty hard to do with a standard uh, you know, vibrato system. So over a decade, musicians have been beating up your guitars, proving that they work, proving that they, in the recordings, proving in their live shows. So we don't have to prove anything anymore. That's why I said the hindsight's great. But at the time, if I made a list right now, I'm th like I said, thank God we're having this conversation today and not then. The list is insane. Let's start a guitar, or let's build, start a guitar company in a recession <laughs> when the industry's dying. <laughs> let's 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 put all this stuff on it the guitar players traditionally don't know anything about or you know right wouldn't know if it was an improvement or not right uh let's make expensive guitars in this market which is a tough market that you're you know the it's the it's the pyramid it's the most expensive market it's why every company and we won't name names has figured out how to dip down into the price points right and uh, and like I said, that's why another unique thing your company does, you are holding the line. Let's be honest, there are very few companies, and I have a very controversial statement. I say it every time, I don't care. When we talk about supporting uh, guitars made in the USA, I always remind people that 70% of Gibson's profits don't come from USA guitar sales, and neither Defenders, and neither do all the other brands, including Paul Reed Smith. They will gladly tell you that a huge portion, if not half of their income, gross sales, are from their import instruments. So by definition, supporting even buying a USA Mid Gibson, they take that. My joke is, and I mean this no respect, as you see, I'm a fan of all brands, but I'm also not naive. Gibson's factory is not bigger. Epiphone's factory is bigger now. So I know when I buy a Gibson, my money, portion of that apparently is going to Epiphone, even if I don't want it to. Good point. So again, it's tough, as you guys know. You've stayed, you've built a quality instrument, stayed in this market. You haven't decided to go, hey, why don't we make a, a nags that's, you know, stripped down and not, you know, because the really reality is as much as people want to say, let's make a more affordable instrument, you're also saying, let's make a lesser instrument. There's nothing wrong with that, but it takes, it takes you know, a lot for you guys to stay in making these high-end quality instruments. Well, we talked about that a lot, actually believe it or not. And <clears throat> I don't know. And, and you know, I, I have a bit, maybe perhaps a bit of a rigid point of view, but I don't like slave labor made things. I don't like things that are made by slave labor. When I say slave labor, I'm talking about people who working very hard and not getting appropriately paid for it. Yes. And that's one, that's one angle. The other angle is every single company Every, every one of the big companies that we all know, that we all grew up with, any, any of them, they all have gone down market. And I don't believe, it may, it may have been great for their revenue, but I don't believe it has been very good for their reputation or their image. Uh, it's very, very difficult to explain to somebody why the same exact guitar from 10 yards away why this one sells for $350, this one for $750, this one for $1,200, this one for $4,000, and this one for $6,000. It is, in my opinion, from a sales point of view, from a branding point of view, impossible to explain. Unless you say, yeah, because they don't get paid much an hour when they nail them together in Indonesia or in, or in China, okay? Um, you know, if you would really go into the the details of how that whole thing works, it would be, uh, to some people, it would be shocking. Yeah, of course. And I don't like that whole concept. And I think Joe doesn't like that whole concept neither. Um, we don't have any, I, I don't have any, we don't have any um, interest in becoming that big. We want to keep it at, at the right size, whatever that size is at any moment. We wanna, we wanna know who our people are, what their wife's names are, and you know, what their kids' names are. Um, I'm not interested, I think Joe thinks the same way, but I let him chime in on that. Uh, we, we, don't have, we don't have this goal of, of being a giant guitar manufacturer. You know, I was driving in here this morning thinking about something else, Phil, because knew we were going to be doing 
an interview of some nature. And, you know, what we do um, is we build tools, okay? We build tools just like someone builds a shovel, <laughs> okay? And then you're going to do something with that tool. And what we do in our industry is we make music, okay? Um, my, my friend, Eric Johnson's father, who was one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life, he said, you know, Joe, you're combining science and art together. And that can be a very complicated mate, mating or a very complicated combination, okay? <clears throat> so, you know, <laughs> we go through it all the time. You're, you're using a tool in the, in the, in the fucking head strips <laughs> and you're right. under a car. Yeah. And it's like, damn it, man. And then you use another tool and you go, man, that tool is a, that tool is a great tool. You know, you have that tool the rest of your life. Okay. That's what we do. We build tools and people make music on them. Okay. Um, I don't really want to make a tool that people go, you know, this thing's okay. This thing, it'll do the gig. You know, it'll do. <laughs> well, that's not really what we're after, okay? What we're after is we want people to play the guitar and go, you know what? This is a, this is a really great tool, man, okay? And, you know, a lot of people, a, a, lot, of, a lot of what I can say that I kind of did at the beginning was I wanted to make a tool that a artist could play and say, I don't have another tool like this one in my bag, okay? Like a lot of people, you know, our guitars have an upper harmonic to them that I think a lot of people, they're not really used to that, okay? And it might throw them for a loop. But eventually, you know, you pick that guitar up and go, man, I like that upper harmonic, okay? So, so that to me can't be achieved by making a cheap instrument that you're not putting your soul into. Right. I don't think you're going to achieve that, you know? And that's, that's really the goal. And that goes for all the guys in the shop, Lucas, you know, everybody in here that's, that's putting guitars together, Michael, they all feel that way. And when we play a guitar, it's like, you know, there's something with this guitar. Okay. Let's take it and let's let's see what's going on, okay? And we do, <laughs> and that takes time, and that costs money, okay? And so, but you have to. To me, you have to be committed to that. Now, you can't be doing that every day, or else you're going to go out of business. So anyway, it is a business, but we are building tools that we want people to use that tool and go, man, that's a great tool. That's the, way I, that's the way we see it. Nice. This is the, the last question, which is the one I know the audience is going to have the, the most question about. Uh, understanding the tiers, <laughs> the one, two, three, or three, two, one, because that's the tricky part, uh, the tier system. Uh, could you explain it and how it kind of generally works? And how, if you were, more importantly, if you were new to NAGS as a, as a customer, guitar player how would you understand when you see that so we started the business by creating a tier system that was sort of specific to a certain amount of attributes on the guitar okay mm -hmm. the appointments you know like the tier one had diamonds and it had a tier one top okay now first of all before i go any further tier one's the highest and tier three is below the tier one, if you want to say below, but it doesn't really mean that, okay? Right. You know, so over time, people were trying to combine stuff all together. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter and I sat and we went through it over and over and over again. You know, we're like, you know what? I think the ticket is just to say, here's what you can choose from. And this goes, so really the tier system to me, at this point, describes the curly maple top oh, or anything else, really. 
you know, yeah. before it was like you had a tier two automatically came with morning stars in a Kanai, for instance. Now you can order a tier one top, but it only it, you can order it with dots, right. or you can order it with blocks. So we call that a la carte menu, if you will. You can basically spec out every single model we make based on the options that we are giving and have approved and are in the option list. Everything that's not in the option list automatically becomes a custom order, requires a, you know, a special quote, right. special consideration and special quote with an upcharge. But our option list is very, very large. Um, so, but this is the, the, when we started, we had the tier system that included specific appointments for the tiers. Now with the a la carte system, you can combine any of the appointments per the model that they are designed for. The only model that isn't like that is the KJ models. Correct. Okay. And okay. they are a, they're not even a tier system they're not in the tier system they are a kj model so you get that guitar it's a mahogany body mahogany neck east indian fingerboard dots nickel hardware and then you can but you can decide what color pick guard you want or what pickups you want okay so those are really it you we don't, we don't even have gold or nickel hardware on them it's it's our it's our uh stripped down version if you want to say but this goes into what you said a little while ago. It's, to me, that guitar is no lesser of a guitar than the Kanai Tier 1. It's, it's just that there, you can't choose all these different things on it. It's still a great guitar. We still make the neck the same way. We still fret it the same way. Okay? By the same people. Same people. So all of that comes into play. The finish may not be as intense as the double stain top or whatever, but that's that really... So we don't have a guitar to me that, you know, to me, when you got the overseas guitars, you know, if you're Gibson, you got, and you got your historic collection and they're made in Nashville, and then you got the Epiphone model, you know, right away that that's going down a rung now could be a good guitar. Okay. But that's the way people will perceive that. And same with Fender, if it's a Squire, you know, same principle. Well, we don't have that here but we do have what we consider our strip now and it's, it's not necessarily a cheap guitar neither so right. but anyway that's the way we that's the way we do it by the way so on a side note you know larry when i asked larry mitchell how come he plays in nags he told me uh that was the first i ever met him this is years and years ago and uh he said oh i was in maryland and uh i was sitting around i think it was at the hotel room and he said I thought, well, why don't I see if there's a you know guitar factory to check out? And he's like, I called the guys at Nags, and they're like, come on down. <laughs> and he said, after he saw your facility and saw your guitars and played one, he's like, I had to play these guitars. And uh, and then uh, that started our friendship because I told him, I said, I said, I I said, I truly believe that I believe this that when you walk into a shop or a factory. Uh, I've done so many of uh, in uh, factory tours and interviews of factory tours and stuff. And I will spend more time talking to employees. And the one thing I love to do is ask them like, how long have you been here? How long have you been here? Why do you work here? And from that, it's never usually in the videos. It's really just how I can sense the, the culture. Cause the culture really dictates everything is what I've learned. The person who has to buff and sand all day, it's the worst job. <laughs> eight, I, right it's eight hours of this you know? well not right. just that not just that it's a very very intricate job yes. you could screw up really easy yes and when you you realize which is why pretty much every manufacturer starts everybody there right and then you realize that's where they graduate from you realize like they have to have something in them that wants to be there to do this you know and you learn that from from uh from the employees and from the you know the, the workers and that's how they become skilled and so like i said when larry was telling me i'm like yep that's what i've learned is i've learned that i can love a guitar all i want but i can walk into a manufacturer and within minutes know not so much how quality is but how consistent that quality will be right <laughs> right they can they tell they like to tell you this is our qa process this right. is how we do it but i can tell you if the employees care if there's any kind of 
bonding, if there's any kind of relationship there, if there's anything like that, that just already almost kind of almost does itself, you know, and takes care of itself. So as always, I want to thank Joe and Peter for coming on the podcast. Well, first of all, Philip, thanks very much. Yeah, for thank you very out. much. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was a pleasant conversation. Um, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward. Perhaps you're going to have more of those. Yeah. Uh, but thanks for reaching out. Thanks for giving us a chance to chat with you. And, you know, I'm sure there'll be other things that are coming up further down the road. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're you're in the thick of things making guitars because it's a business, okay? And so you really um, don't think of the things that you're asking, okay? So it's kind of a pleasure to talk about them. It's a pleasure to talk about, you know, it's like a musician that's writing a score. It's like, and it's just taking hours and hours and hours. And finally, man, how did you come up with that? Oh, well, wow, that's a nice question to answer. You know? So, so that it's always a pleasure to answer. I would have never thought my wildest dreams playing guitar when I was 11 years old that I would be doing an interview about guitar making. You know, it's kind of interesting how life takes you. So, so it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. And you're invited. Oh, thank you. I would, I would love to. So, as always, I want to thank Joe and Peter. For coming on the podcast and talking about this highly unique guitar company. And uh, I really urge you guys to check one out. I will put links down below if you're listening or if you're watching, there'll be links down below for you to check out more about their guitars. Especially if you're listening, you have missed out on some of the most beautiful looking guitars that I've been po- uh, posting across this entire podcast. So please make sure to check out their website. As always, guys, thank you so much for your time. To the next time, know your gear.